Good afternoon and welcome to today's webinar. It's the third in a series of webinars addressing too much water and too little water. Uh, my name is Neil Bomberg and I'm a senior policy advisor with the National Association of Regional Councils. Uh, before I go any further, I just want to apologize. I live in a condominium. There is construction going on in the apartment above me, the apartment beside me, and the apartment below me. So if there is any background noise, I apologize for that. I'm joined today by Lonnie Hunt, uh, the executive director of the Deep East Texas Council of Governments and Economic Development District, or DETCOG, which is headquartered in Lufton, Texas, and by our technical guru, Jessica Rutzan, a NARC program assistant, who will be conducting the questions and comments portion of this webinar later on. Uh, today, you'll be learning about how dramatic shifts in the amount of rainfall have impacted the East Texas region and what that means to the counties, cities, and towns that make up the region and how the regional council is attempting to address these issues. As climate continues to change in all parts of the country and the world, some areas have been inundated by too much rain, resulting in significant flash flooding that can cause significant problems for local governments and the people who live there. DETCOG's region is one of those areas of the nation where an overabundance of rainfall has significantly impacted the infrastructure of the region and the safety of the people who live there. I am sure that most of you will remember Hurricane Harvey and the tremendous flooding it brought to Houston because of the unusual amounts of rain that fell. Well, the problem was not just in Houston, it was felt throughout East Texas. The local television station, KTRE9, reported that Lufkin, Texas, a city within DETCOG, received more than a foot of rain during Hurricane Harvey. And areas to the south and east received as much as 24 to 30 inches of rain. Now put that in perspective, that is 21 to 30 inches more rain that is normal for the entire month of August and 18 inches more rain than the average hurricane produces. Rainfalls of this type will inevitably cause significant flooding that can also prove quite emotionally and financially costly to the residents of the region as well as to the towns, cities, and counties that make up the region. And more, when more than 30% of households in some counties live in poverty, the personal costs will be even greater. Within 20 to 30 years, it's estimated that the number of properties at risk of damage from flash flooding within the town of Lufkin alone will increase by 5%, and the costs will increase, the related costs could increase by more than 10%. The Deep East Texas Council, as you will hear, has been working very hard to mitigate the impacts of torrential rainstorms and decrease the incidence of major flash floods. To learn, to learn more about how DECOG is responding, allow me to present our speaker, Lonnie Hunt. Lonnie is the executive director of the Deep East Texas Council of Governments. Lonnie was named director by DETCOG Board of Directors in 2016. Prior to joining DETCOG, Lonnie served as County Relations Officer for the Texas Association of Counties in Austin. And before that, he served as a county judge of Houston County, Texas. Lonnie was also a radio broadcaster for 30 plus years. Most of those years were at KIVY AM FM radio in Crockett, Texas, but he also spent several years as president and CEO of Nickel Broadcasting, 
which owned and operated several AM and FM stations in Texas. One final note before I turn the microphone over to Lonnie. Lonnie will speak for about 20 minutes after which we will take your questions and comments. At the bottom of the screen, you will see a Q&A icon. Please tap on the icon and enter your questions in the box provided. Once Randy's presentation is done, Jessica, as I mentioned, of the NARC staff will begin the QS Q and A and or the Q question and comment process. In total, the webinar should run for about thirty minutes. With that, let me turn it over to our speaker, Lonnie Hunt. Thank you, Neil, and thank you, Jessica. And I will do my best to stay on that twenty-minute timeline. Um, hopefully, if I just follow along with the slides, I'll I'll be good about that. Um, I want to first tell you a little bit about our region of Texas. We are known as Deep East Texas, and on if, if you're uh, online, you see the our region shaded there at the at the right of the state of Texas. We border with Louisiana. We are inland, uh, yet we are close enough to the coast that we've had severe impacts from multiple hurricanes, uh, and we're also in an area that's uh, a, a pretty wet and hot and humid climate. It's very hot and humid today, as a matter of fact. In fact, we've got heat advisories in effect down in our part of the world today. But this is our region. Now, technically, uh, there are 12 counties shaded here. Earlier this year, uh, the governor has transferred one of these counties out of our region into another regional planning commission. Uh, Jasper County technically is no longer part of Deep East Texas. But in reality, uh, all the programs I'm talking about today have been done with, with Jasper County in the fold. And we continue because of the transition period, we'll continue to uh, be of service to them for some period of time. So uh, they're still shaded in on the map here and very much a part of what we consider to be deep East Texas. But that is our region. We are rural. Uh, we're one of the more rural regions in Texas and in the nation. Uh, in Texas, there are 24 regional planning commissions. 20 of them have urban centers surrounded by rural counties, but only four of us are totally rural. And we're one of those with no urban center. Our largest city, Lufkin, has about 35,000 population. Uh, we are very large. Uh, geographically, we're larger than six states, over 10,000 square miles. And so uh, with 385,000 people scattered over that large an area, we, we're, you know, we're, we're, we're very rural. Uh, there are four national forests in Texas. All four of them are in deep East Texas. The three largest reservoirs in the state of Texas, you may have heard of some of those, uh, Toledo Bend, Sam Rayburn, Lake Livingston, they're all within our region. Uh, so we're very much the country north of Houston. Uh, we're about uh, 150 miles inland. Uh, but again, we have been greatly impacted not only with uh, uh, hurricanes, but other natural disasters. Uh, we are also a historically economically distressed region. If you look at statistics for Deep East Texas, you'll find that our poverty rates are considerably higher than the state and national rates. Our uh, income levels are lower. Uh, uh, nine of our 12 counties have actually declined in population since 2010, and the disasters have certainly hit hard. Uh, we've got other issues. Lack of broadband is a big one, and I probably will talk about that before we're done here today. But, uh, but all of these repeating disasters, whether it be rainstorm, floods, uh, tornadoes, hurricanes, uh, they they help, you know, it's just like you get somebody down, you keep your foot on their neck. They help keep us from springing back like we would like to spring back out of some of these things. So I just say all that to tell you that we are a region that faces a lot of challenges. Uh, this is our facility. We're very proud of it. And I've got this here because this is one of the things that we have done uh, to aid in uh, disaster mitigation and disaster preparation and disaster response and recovery in our region. This, we've been in this facility for about a year and a half. Uh, 
this facility was funded in part by an EDA grant. The EDA gave us a million dollar grant uh, to go with $250,000 in local funding to build a regional emergency operations center and command center. And that was in response to Hurricane Ike, which occurred uh, back in 2008. We were able to take that EDA award of a million dollars and come up with some additional funding from other sources and with the EDA's blessing, we were able to leverage that into about a $3.1 million facility, which is basically paid for. And it houses not only that emergency operations and command center that EDA originally funded, but all of our programs and all of our operations under one roof. So uh, the fact that we have this facility here has certainly helped us. Uh, this is just a look inside the emergency operations and command center. This was during Hurricane Laura We've been in this building for about a year and a half. We've already activated this center twice around the clock. One was for Hurricane Laura, and the other time was during Winter Storm Uri this past winter, which of course had a severe impact on us and everyone else in the state of Texas. But it's we did not have a facility like this prior to this building where we could bring in our state and federal partners and provide uh, around the clock assistance and uh, uh, activity to support our communities dealing with disasters either in preparation or during the disaster or in the aftermath of the disaster. So uh, this facility, which started with an EDA grant, has been one of the things that DETCOG has done uh, that's made our region better equipped to deal with these situations. Uh, in addition to the EOC and command center, we have other programs here within our facility that complement that. For example, the 211 call center is one of those. And uh, 211 is who you call if, you're, if you need something and you don't know where to get help and it's not an emergency. Obviously, you dial 911 in an emergency. We, have, we operate the 911 network for our region as well. And that office is also adjacent to the EOC. And we have a backup PSAP, public safety answering point in there that can be put into use in an emergency situation. But the 211 call center is uh, valuable in that when disasters strike, people need to know where can I go evacuate? Uh, they've got all kinds of questions. And in the aftermath of disasters, how can I get help? And many of those calls are routed through the 211 system. And so having that literally across the hallway from our EOC is, is a, just another valuable addition for us and a good example of different program, working across program lines and out of silos uh, with collaboration that helps everybody. Now, this program is titled uh, RAIN, and I'm going to get to rainstorms, but I just point this out because in our inland region, you saw how far inland we were, four of the 11 costliest hurricanes in U.S. history have directly impacted our region uh, over the last 15 years or so. Rita, well, Katrina and Rita were the first two. Katrina and then Rita right on the heels of it back in 2005. Uh, in Katrina, we were a region that was greatly impacted by evacuees from Louisiana and also the Gulf Coast of Texas. And then Rita came along on the heels of that and 11 of our 12 counties were disaster counties because of storm damage from Hurricane Rita. And then Ike came along in 2008 and all 12 of our counties were disaster counties, and I did not uh, weaken to less than a hurricane till after it had already passed all the way through the northern part of our region. And then Harvey, of course, which is the second costliest hurricane in U.S. history, uh, hit here in 2017. And while it impacted all 12 of our counties, seven of our 12 counties were in the presidential disaster declaration for Hurricane Harvey. So, uh, you know, when you look at an inland region like this, that's a lot of disasters. Uh, I, I threw this, Laura is one of the smaller hurricanes, to be honest, but I put this up here because I think this gives you a good example of, in our region, how things impact us. 35% uh, of the households impacted by Hurricane Laura are poverty households. 18% of them are senior citizens over the age of 65. 48% of the households, and this is pretty typical for every disaster, whatever it is, 48% of our folks that were impacted by the disaster are uninsured. 
And so those are just extra challenges we face here in rural deep East Texas. Now, this may look like flooding from a hurricane, but it's not. This is flooding from heavy rainfall. This is the community of Deweyville, Texas in Newton County, which is our far Eastern County, right along the Louisiana border and along the Sabine River. Uh, and the entire community of Deweyville was inundated with water. And not once, not twice, but three times in the last few years. 2016 was the worst. You see the school uh, buildings there in the middle of that larger picture. And uh, this is just caused by heavy rains upriver and upstream flowing. The rains affected this community, but also the heavy runoff from rains north of there just piled on and added to it as the water comes down the river. And, and uh, this is how you normally would go from our region over to Louisiana uh, near Deweyville, Texas in Newton County. So uh, you see, it doesn't have to be a hurricane to have mass uh, flooding and mass destruction. I want to talk about some of the projects. We have a lot of projects uh, that are either underway or about to get underway within our region. I believe if you total these up, it's over $100 million in mitigation projects. Uh, among our cities, we have the city of Ivanhoe, which is has a dam that needs to be reconstructed uh, and various other uh, uh, projects. But these mitigation projects are all going to be local projects conducted by cities and counties within our region. They, the funding is based on the fact that they were impacted from these past disasters like the 2016 floods and Hurricane Harvey. But the funding is for mitigation projects to make communities more resilient and more able to withstand future disasters. So this is not traditional disaster recovery projects, but truly mitigation projects. And it's the first time we've had the opportunity in our region to get significant mitigation funding. So our, our communities have taken very good advantage of it. City of Newton is a small town of about 2,500 people. Ivanhoe is a town of about 1,500 people. So that's serious money uh, being put into infrastructure in these small communities. Uh, Newton with two projects combined, there's uh, over $11 million. Pineland is another small city of about probably 1,500 people that's going to get uh, major sewer system improvements. San Augustine is a community of about 1,000, 1,200 people. It's going to get major water system improvements. Uh, and on down the list, I, I won't try to you know, highlight each of them, but each of these cities are getting significant drainage and infrastructure improvements uh, to make them better able to withstand the next flood that comes along, no matter what the source of the flood water may be, rain, hurricane, or what have you. And then uh, our, some of our, several of our counties have mitigation projects also. Uh, Jasper County being the, the largest projects there combined over $18 million and they're gonna build additional stormwater detention basins, which will be mainly along a major highway evacuation route, uh, new drainage structures, and also some serious county road improvements and flood mitigation, which includes drainage, elevation of roads in key areas, hardening of roads, et cetera. Uh, Newton County, Sabine County, I'm gonna uh, highlight them in a moment. Uh, they're gonna replace 19 bridges and culverts. When these rains happen, our county roads, our typical county probably has 600 miles or more of county roads. Some of them are hard top, when I say hard top roads in our region, that's traditionally a mixture of oil, sand. It's, it's not like a, uh, what you would call a paved highway in many communities, uh, but it is a, a oil, sand, hard service road. But many, many of our county roads in Deep East Texas are dirt and gravel and limestone based roads without a hard surface on them. And so those roads are extremely susceptible when flooding occurs to culverts washing out and bridges washing out and roads washing out. Um, San Augustine County is gonna be able to build a countywide safe shelter uh, with some of this mitigation funding and also do a number of other drainage projects. I mentioned Sabine County just because I think it's a, it's a, it's a typical example. Sabine County was not one of the most impacted Hurricane Harvey counties. It is in the presidential disaster declaration, but 
when you hear about Sabine County, we've got other counties that had significantly more damage. So this represents low end damage from Hurricane Harvey. They had up to 30 inches of rain at 175 creek crossings on county roads, 125 of them were flooded and closed. Uh, they did a very smart thing. The initial round of funding that we got, or that they got, uh, as in the very first early funding from Hurricane Harvey, Sabine County share was only $165,000. We didn't feel like we got our fair share of infrastructure funding in the early Harvey uh, funding. We were making up some ground in later rounds of funding. But in the initial funding, Sabine County only got 165,000. They could have gone and done some little small project that would have benefited one little small area within their county, but they were very smart in my opinion. They used that money rather than try to go do a little small project that really is not gonna have much impact. They did a flood study so that they could be prepared to go after the more serious money that we all felt was going to be coming down sooner or later, and it did. And because they used that initial 165,000 to go do the flood study, they were prepared and Sabine County knocked it out of the ballpark when the state opened up this mitigation grant competition. And as a result, they received an $11.2 million. So in effect, because of good planning and strategic thinking on their part, they leveraged $165,000 into an $11 million project that's gonna have a huge benefit for their county and will replace 19 bridges or culverts, elevate roads in a number of places and make other uh, drainage improvements. Also this last bullet point, just to point out to you that uh, Sabine County is one of those counties that has a lot of national forest land in it. And so they're dealing with hundreds of miles of county roads, but this does not even take into account almost 500 miles of county and US Forest Service roads that go through the national forest lands in Sabine County. And the county's responsible under contracts with the US Forest Service for a lot of the road maintenance on those roads. So uh, again, it's sort of unique here in the what we call the Texas forest country of deep East Texas. Now I wanna talk about a couple of projects that DETCOG is sponsoring and working on as a region through our organization. And these are not so traditional mitigation projects, but you got to think outside the box. We have a huge broadband uh, problem. We've known about it for a long time. It's like because of the pandemic that has affected everyone, the whole country now seems to be aware that rural areas in particular and the country in general is lacking severely in broadband. Well, not that we're smarter than everybody else, but we're sitting here in a totally rural, large region. We've known it's a problem for a long time. So we started about three and a half years ago working on a regional broadband initiative. And when some of this mitigation funding became available, we saw the opportunity to apply to do some good for our broadband. And we've had one success story and one near miss. We hadn't given up yet, but we had been awarded a $9 million grant and it was through the same mitigation uh, grant competition that's funding all these roads and bridges and drainage projects uh, around our region and other parts of the state. Uh, I believe we were the only uh, one that applied for a broadband project, but it was eligible under the guidelines of the grant and we certainly have a need for it and we need better communication to get people ready for disasters to help them respond during disasters and to help recover after a disaster. And don't let anybody tell you that broadband is not just important and communications are not just as important as roads and bridges and culverts and, and drainage projects. It, in our region where we're so severely lacking, it's critically important. So we got a $9 million grant and we are going to begin building a regional rural broadband network in Newton County. The, the near miss we had is we requested an additional $100 million grant, which would have allowed us to build that same type of a, rear, a, a rural network in all 12 of our counties. And we missed the funding there by two and a half points. 
so we got very close, but no cigar. But we have certainly uh, awakened a lot of people, I think, and 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 stirred some folks, and and we're we're continuing to push forward. We also have a real issue in our region with interoperable emergency radio communications. It is basically non-existent and has been. If you've been around since 9-11, you'll know that after 9-11, back in the early 2000s, a lot of money came down Homeland Security type funding uh, that was used to uh, improve interoperable radio communications in a lot of places. Our region did a lot of good projects, but we didn't get our interoperable radio situation corrected and fixed as a result of that. So we are still 20 years after 9-11 dealing with that problem. We have recently received a million dollar grant, which is doing some critical uh, improvements along our most traveled corridor, which is US Highway 59 and soon to be Interstate 69 that goes north, south through our region. The need is still tremendous all over the region. We did ask for a $60 million grant as part of those mitigation funds, and we did not get that grant, but we're doing what we're making progress for the first time with this uh, small grant from the governor's office. And, and that is also truly a significant need for us. And again, I'll get off broadband, but I just want to show you the, the $100 million grant that we did not get what it would have done. It would have covered all the households in shaded areas on this map throughout our region. Some of our counties like St. Augustine County and Sabine County and Trinity County that are more rural and poorer and more needy, they would have had 100% broadband coverage instead of the cherry picking that we have seen and we continue to see uh, with existing broadband providers. Some of our other counties would have been up close to 90% coverage some of our counties would have been 50 to 60% and even some less than 50%, but it would have given us a tremendous fiber backbone to expand and build upon to eventually reach the dream of broadband for every home and business in our region. So I'll get off of broadband now. I want to just briefly mention tornadoes because we've in the last, in a, in a 12 month period, this tornado here, these pictures are from Onalaska, Texas, which is a community on Lake Livingston in Polk County, uh, April of last year. Uh, devastating. It's not the only tornado. In a one-year period, we uh, the tornado there in Onalaska resulted in three deaths and 33 injuries and 170 homes leveled. We've had multiple other tornadoes back in 2019, less than a year prior to that with fatalities and injuries and significant damages. Uh, and the problem that we see in Texas, and I don't know how this works in other states, uh, but in Texas anyway, you know, to qualify for federal funding, you have to reach a certain threshold with FEMA in damages for your county, but then the state has to also reach a certain statewide threshold. And what happens in cases like this, a tornado, an isolated tornado, or a few tornadoes hits some of our rural communities and devastates them. But the state of Texas has no damage anywhere else. And as a result, we don't reach the statewide threshold. And therefore these communities are not eligible for federal disaster recovery funding from FEMA or other sources. And that's a real problem. And I say this, just I assume it's, it's we can't be the only place where this is an issue and a problem. And we need to have a little more advocacy uh, to try to both with our state governments and our federal government to understand that no matter how widespread the disaster is, if one particular community is wiped out or heavily impacted by a tornado or another disaster, that community needs help. And under the current funding formulas, they don't get it unless a lot of other communities in their state are also heavily damaged or wiped out. So I, I have to preach about that for a minute. And then I'm going to close with lessons learned. Some of these go without saying, but I think it's good to repeat them sometimes. I have to remind myself of things I already know. Number one, start planning yesterday. You, you've got to have a plan and you've got to be strategic. You never know when opportunities will come along. And if you wait until you see the funding opportunity to start trying to get a plan together, often it's too late. For example, 
the $9 million broadband grant that we got that we're going to start building this rural broadband network, had we not already, and we've been working on that for three and a half years, had we not already been well underway with the planning on that, there is no way we could have put together a successful application because it was a competitive grant. There were $6 billion in grant applications and only $1 billion available to fund projects. If we hadn't already had a plan in place, we couldn't have turned around fast enough to meet the grant application deadline and get that grant. So any investment in strategically uh, plans, strategic plan, I, I don't mean strategic plans as in your organization, I mean specific plans to address needs, but be strategic about them is what I'm saying. That's a good investment. Know your capacity and limitations. We used outside grant consultants. Uh, we don't have, we, we're, we're, we're as smart as anybody on EDA grants, but we don't have a lot of experience in CDB grant world as far as applying and administering grants. And so we brought in a grant, a private grant consultant to help us work with our engineers, make the application, and they will administer and manage the grant for us to make sure it's done right. And so don't be afraid to say, that's above my pay grade, or that exceeds our capacity, or that's just an area. These grants, some of them are so competitive, you need every little edge you can get. And there is no way we would have gotten that first broadband grant without the expertise that the private outside grant consultant brought to us. Design flexible projects, that, that goes without saying, but, but, and the next one goes right with it. Read the grant guidance and scoring criteria. I cannot tell you the number of times I've heard people and seen results where someone applied for a grant. And if you just read the NOFA and all the details in it, it tells you exactly how to maximize your score on that grant. And yet entities will continue to apply for what they want the grant to do, as opposed to what the grant spells out that it is intended to do. And in these competitive grant situations, a point or two here, there two and a half more points, and we'd have a hundred million dollar broadband project going right now that is transformational for our region. And then think outside the box again. We went after funding, and we got nine million of it in a competition that everybody else looked at for roads and bridges and drainage projects. And we saw the opportunity to go after broadband, which was badly needed in our region and is going to make us more resilient for future disasters. So look for opportunities uh, and don't just get your blinders off, I guess is what I'm saying. And with that, I might have gone a minute or two over, but you had a long introduction, Neil. So I, I think I'm, I'm kind of close. <laughs> Thank you so much for that great presentation, Lonnie. Um, we are over a little bit, but we certainly have a couple minutes for questions. So I'll just jump right in. Uh, the first question I think we had from David, it is, uh, are there efforts to buy out property owners in the most impacted areas to preserve them for flood management? Yes, there are. Those are being, the, the COG is not itself involved in the buyout and acquisition program, but local communities, there was a significant amount of buyout and acquisition money awarded. Uh, but I, that's tough in a rural region like ours. A lot of people do not want to be bought out. Uh, they live on family-owned property that's been in their family for generations, and they, you know, it, it, it's tough. It, it, in a more urban setting, uh, I'm sure that program would be much more successful. Some of our communities have had limited success with it, but, but the answer is yes, there are programs offered, but we don't find a lot of takers on those programs, to be perfectly honest with you. Thank you. Uh, and one more question. Uh, can you tell us more about how you were able to turn the $1 million EDA grant into an emergency command center uh, into a $3 million facility that houses all of your programs? Uh, sure. We're very proud of this. Um, you know, number one, we couldn't do it unless the EDA, and, and in our particular case, it's George Ayala, who's the regional director over the Austin region, which is our five state region of EDA uh, here in Texas and surrounding states. Uh, his commitment to helping us, I, I have always felt like EDA is that one 
state or federal agency. It's federal, of course, but, but we deal with a lot of federal and state agencies. And EDA is the poster child for trying to help us as opposed to sometimes it feels like some of these agencies are trying to make our life more difficult. That doesn't mean that they don't have rules to go by, but, but EDA was very open when we, we just had a big need. Uh, we were actually located in another community on the edge of our region, a smaller, more rural community, uh, had been there for years because that's uh, 40 years ago, that's where some free office space was available as the COG was in its infancy and starting to grow. But we needed to be in the center of the region. We needed to be in the hub of the region. And Lufkin is geographically the center and the hub as far as commerce and population and what have you. So we need, plus we had programs scattered all over the region and it's hard to be effective, especially in a rural spread out region like we are. So we desperately needed a central facility where we could get all our programs under one roof and somewhere in the middle, in the center of our region. Uh, the next step after EDA, we went and started talking to a private foundation, the TLL Temple Foundation, which is based here in Lufkin. It serves a, probably 35 counties of Texas, but this happens to be their home. And they were very interested in what we were doing and supporting us. And so, and they also had made investments in this particular community, which is known as North Lufkin, which is a minority community that historically, uh, you know, needs a shot in the arm and needs redevelopment. And so this fit right in with some of the other strategies of the Temple Foundation to help us get a facility here in North Lufkin to contribute to the revitalization of this particular community. And so the Temple Foundation said, we'll give you another million dollars if you can, if you can leverage some more money. And so then we went to the city of Lufkin, their economic development corporation, uh, and they contributed land to build our building. They gave us uh, uh, some cash grant, some low interest, long-term loan, uh, and we're just very helpful. We went to another foundation, the Kurth Foundation, and got some additional funding. And so we were able to pull funding from uh, both the Lufkin Economic Development and two private foundations. And then we had a little of our own money, not a lot, but a little bit, uh, that we had uh, been saving up in a building fund and put all that together to uh, leverage that million dollar EDA investment into a $3.1 million facility. And it's basically paid for. We, we owe about $170,000, give or take at the bank. Uh, and so not only has it greatly helped us improve our service in all of our program areas, but it's also helped us financially uh, to the nth degree because the facility is paid for. That's fantastic. Um, I will, thank you. Thank you so much for answering those questions and for your presentation again, such great information. Uh, I will turn things back over to Neil who will wrap things up. Thank you, Jess. Uh, very briefly, um, thank you again, Lonnie. Uh, from Jess, Leslie Wallach, our executive director and me, uh, we'd like to thank you for your outstanding presentation. It's clear your region has suffered greatly and you're doing some very innovative things to address uh, what has happened. 